Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We will begin the uh, Public Works Committee. Um, as usual, we have a general agenda and a consent agenda. Uh, consent agenda items will be considered via one motion, except for those that are pulled for discussion. Are there any consent agenda items that need to be pulled for discussion? C1. C1. Hearing none others, uh, is there a motion to approve the remainder? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right. I, I, I get it. I don't Are get we it. waiting for uh, motions? Yeah. No. We don't have any commands. All right. Uh, we had a motion by Mr. Taylor and a second by Mr. Larson. I love technology. I downloaded again. No. Mm -hmm. There you go. Magic. Yeah, well, that's not because I didn't push anything on the screen, though. All right, well, the, the, all right, those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed, no? The record will reflect that that was unanimous approval for that motion. That's approval of items C2 on through the consent agenda. Uh, we'll now move to item C1, please. Item C1, information regarding 7th Street Seacole, East Ward. All right, and um, uh, Mr. Turner will present, and the question is from Mr. Larson. Do you have a, a what's a going on in Seventh? Yeah, what's going on in Seventh Street sinkhole? Okay. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, there was a sinkhole discovered in the Seventh Street area, near the well, just to the east of the railroad, um, as depicted on the attachment number two in your package. Uh, staff has been talking to the railroad about the issue. It's in the railroad's right of way where the tracks cross over 7th Street, and it's therefore a combination of city right-of-way and railroad right-of-way. Uh, after expressing our concerns about the safety for the roadway collapsing and the possibility that the train tracks would also be at risk, uh, the railroad decided that they would fill in the hole with gravel uh, in order to stabilize the situation to their satisfaction. We've been working with their individuals to try to come to a solution that would allow for the removal of the void creating situation, which was basically from a stormwater system, uh, stormwater pipes that had developed a void. Uh, and so we are continuing to work with their staff, but the railroad being both out of state and having Trump authority over any kind of um, condemnation activities that we may wish to make uh, is somewhat time consuming to get approvals from. Is 7th Street closed now still? Or yes. Is it real? It's still closed? closed? It's still closed. Okay. Is it appropriate to ask about Northwest Boulevard as well and, and the and sinkhole there? Certainly. We'd be happy to answer if you have a question. Uh, we got two sinkholes in the city streets right now, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, the Northwest Boulevard situation is being worked on. There's a legal issue there for getting access to private property. Um, easier to work on that, actually, than with the railroad, but we still have to go through certain processes in order to compel access to private property, but we are working through that. Uh, we got direction from the council at the last meeting last Monday to work on that when Councilmember Clark, I think, mentioned to the full council that they wish for staff to try to expedite the activity there, and we've heard from several other individual council members about that concern. Can I ask uh, how we made the determination that Northwest Boulevard was imperiled enough to close that road, and it's been closed now for, what, six weeks or so? The uh, building to the north of Northwest Boulevard had basically no floor, and evidence presented to us from a engineering firm that we had worked with who had gone into that building. We didn't send any staff into the building ourselves, but the evidence from that engineer said that it was likely that the void that was 
under the building also extended out under the sidewalk and under the street and until we can get in and actually do excavation work ourselves to determine how extensive and if that is in fact correct we felt it was appropriate to close the road in order to make sure that we didn't have a devastating uh, viol a devastating situation for the public now, is, it, is it possible to do corings or something to make a determination as whether we have voids underneath that road and, and reopen the road. I mean, right now, the, the sinkhole is off the right of way, not on city property. And, and we've closed a road based on the belief that perhaps that sinkhole has expanded further south. And I guess, you know, and looking at it, you know, I don't see cracks or anything jump up and down on it, whatever. But, you know, I guess the question is, is there a scientific method while all this litigation is going on uh, to allow us to do some testing to actually see if underneath the road itself uh, is in peril or can and so we can reopen that road we've looked at borings we've looked at um, ground penetrating radar we've mm -hmm. looked at even exploratory digging mm -hmm. uh, but we don't think that any of those solutions until we're actually able to get onto the property where the void is would give us a definitive answer to the satisfaction of being able to say we could open a road for the public safely so how long are the merchants on Northwest Boulevard going to continue? I'm going to have to look to the attorneys to get an opinion as to what the response time we can expect would be on the legal action. So, We're moving forward with enforcement and legal action, and I'll be happy to update you all offline. Okay. I would appreciate it. It's, 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 a, it's a problem. We're seeing sinkholes all over the city right now, I noticed. Not yeah. all of them impact the public right away, though. But like yeah, exactly. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions about this item? Is it if not, this is an information item. We'll move now to the general agenda, please. Item G1, proposed changes on on-street handicapped parking ordinance. And Mr. Turner is reporting the uh, uh, item here. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, this item is back to you in response to the comments we received last time. Uh, it essentially has the same elements as in the past. However, there are two major um, additions that have been added. Uh, requirements that if a property has a garage that there are specifications for when we would allow for on-street handicap under that situation and also if a property has a driveway that meets certain specifications when we would allow for handicap parking in that situation and then finally there's a requirement that there be a determination by the city's department of transportation that there's a sufficiency of need for the on-street handicap parking not just a request from the property owners those are the three major changes, two of which are uh, geographical, if you will, or uh, topographical, and the third is a more uh, significant overall coverage of a sufficiency of need evaluation. They have been answered. Any questions? Just an opening question, uh, Mr. Turner. Uh, is this in the posture of uh, the committee potentially requesting that an ordinance be drafted to carry out uh, what you just said, or is this? or do we have in fact an ordinance available i don't see one in the packet this is just feedback as to the comments that you made last time if you're comfortable with this concept then we we bring back, we would bring back revisions to the existing ordinance that the council approved several months ago i see all right uh, questions or discussion uh th thank you i think it's, it's a, a great step forward I, I do have a few um questions i guess uh regarding the um Paragraph two, maximum one half of the frontage of adjacent property may be designated or considered for on street. Why, why one half? What, I mean, a, a car, if we were to do a designated parking space, is that going to require two signs or one sign or how? A designated would, space would require two signs regardless of yeah, so, dimension. So how, I mean, if we say, you know, it's a, it's a 70 foot wide lot or something, um, and we're saying half the parking, half the front. How do we figure that? I mean, one car, two cars? Um, Each car is roughly 26, 25 feet, let's say. Yeah. So um, you would divide whatever space is available by 25, mm -hmm. and that's how many spaces you get. I guess I'm kind of curious as to why we wouldn't want to designate a handicapped parking space um, specifically. Uh, considering, you know, that I don't know how many multiple vehicles they have or what we're dealing with, but I'm wondering how much of this public street designation uh, we need to do, particularly if you just say a half, half of a lot. I, it seems to me to be a little, a little vague. I don't know what my other council members feel about it, but I, 
I think, you know, if we're going to do a handicapped parking space in front of a house, we give space for one car or two cars. And, and if we're going to have to put up two signs, we put up two signs that reflect that amount of space. Um, and, and, and go ahead and lock it down. And, and that's, that's what's required. Uh, if, if the need exists for two handicapped parking space because there's two handicapped individuals driving separate cars in that household, then you know, we, have, we have that condition. I mean, I'm assuming it's a case-by-case -case example here that we, can, that we can justify. I love the idea of reviewing it every two years. I think that's, I think that's an excellent uh, way to ensure that these things don't proliferate over the neighborhoods and, and stay in place forever. I appreciate your recognition that driveways and garages do function uh, well within uh, parking requirements, and I think that's all, all good stuff. But I, I, I was just trying to rationalize sort of the, the amount of street property frontage that any, any individual house might have. I'll refer to your comments on, on that as well. Do you have any thoughts on that? I just believe I just believe that anything that we can always do to enhance the quality of life of people that are uh, challenged physically um, we need to do all we can uh, much like we got around to because of the a citizen that we uh, added on street parking downtown so they could come and enjoy their tax dollars as well so whatever it is that we can do to enhance, uh, I have people in my family that are, you know, have a handicap, uh, physical ailments, uh, and they can always appreciate when they can park without any issues so they can get out and, and go in, whether it's in front of their house or whether it's at the mall or whether it's downtown, it doesn't matter. So I'm pro whatever we need to do to make it easier for them. Okay. Other questions or comments? Just outside of Councilmember Larson's concerns about the number of parking spaces, I mean, I, I, I'm prepared to ask staff uh, that they bring back an ordinance for our consideration. Uh, I think this accomplishes everything that we set out to accomplish, and it's a step forward for those uh, who may have uh, ailments or handicaps uh, who live in the city. Right, any problem with adding um, a look at the suggestions that Mr. Larson raised? Not at this time. Okay. One space, one, basically one space per ticketed car. One or, space or, is, or, or well, do you want to do one space or one, one space per individual? One space for one individual in the, in the house. Assuming you may have more than one individual who is authorized to have a handicap sticker on their cars that they would... Placards. Uh, placards, thank you. Placards on their cars that they would have that number of spaces available to them in front. We're getting ready to authorize a lot of people parking on streets here uh, with this new um, auxiliary building thing. And I think we just need to be real clear about designating spaces fairly tightly here uh, to make sure that they're properly allocated, properly protected. I, I totally agree with uh, Council Member Adams that we need to do that, but it just needs to be regulated in a tight manner so everybody knows exactly where it is and not just half of a lot or whatever saying out there. So. Okay, so I think we've got consensus to bring back a, a draft uh, with the, um, uh, the addition that uh, Mr. Larson was suggesting. So we don't need a, a vote on this as information and feedback. Mm -hmm. item. Thank you, staff. Thank you very much. You. Good work. Let's go then to item G2, please. Item G2, ordinance establishing standards for small wireless facilities in the right of way in the city of Mississippi. Okay. And this also is Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner just can frame this for us. We actually have an, act, uh, an item before us that we could act on at this time if we so chose. That is correct, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Please review. So, Mr. Chairman, as you recall, we've talked about the uh, small cells concept several times over the last several months. Uh, we had an initial discussion about the imminence of this technology coming to our community. We talked about the benefits and we talked about the fact that there are actually some of these facilities already in place on state roads. We also talked about the fact that the state statutes that are, were at that time working their way through the system that would affect our ability to regulate these types of facilities. And we also committed that we would develop an ordinance that we felt was consistent with that statute uh, or the, the bill that was working its way through the system. Uh, that bill has now passed and has become law. And so we are working, we have developed an ordinance 
in compliance. Uh, the ordinance has several sections, uh, the purpose and scope, the definitions, the permitted uses and applications and fees, the administrative process, uh, the facilities and the right of way and what the requirements are for those things and what restrictions that we place on those things, the permit limitations, the requirements for removal and revocation of the permits if the facilities are not being maintained or are no longer needed or are a safety issue. And finally, uh, discussion about uh, co-location on property, on facilities, poles specifically, that the city may own. Uh, there are a couple of things I think the commission, uh, the council members have asked about that we've made sure to incorporate into the ordinance. There is a uh, outright ban on them in historic districts and a restriction on them in historic, dis historic overlay districts. Uh, they are required to be located where practical on property lines between properties or at corners so as to not be in front of homes. Uh, and we do require that they be as unobtrusive as possible with the language we're allowed to use in the ordinance. I think that captured many of the concerns that council members had. Uh, one thing I would tell you is that uh, the limitation on height is 50 feet, which is uh, 10 feet above the maximum street light type pole that you might have. We would hope that, and there is also a strict 10 foot limit on whatever the height of the pole is. So if the pole is only, 40, or is only 30 feet, then the um, antenna and system could only be an additional 10 feet above that. Uh, but the maximum height for anything would be 50 feet in the public right of way. And then council would be able to approve others that are taller than that uh, off the right of way under your normal cell tower ordinance. May I ask, uh, does the <coughs> 50 foot um, uh, language track the authority of the statute or is that a staff recommendation? No, it's tracking the statute language and that. Uh, Ms. Goonshold is here from the attorney's office to answer any detailed questions you have about the statute. Right. Questions? Okay. Comment, I, I, well, question. Um, did anybody tune into the webcast today that the league did? Ms. Goonshold did. Did you? Yes, uh, this morning the presentation by yeah. the league on House Bill 310, I, I did listen. I just caught the tail end of it because we were at the, the quarry opening, but, and I've been following this pretty closely. We don't really have a whole lot to say in where these things go, what they look like. We don't. Um, the a, little bit of, a little bit of very small effort to say you're participating, but in, in, in reality, these things are going to go where they're going to go. That's right. Um, the House bill actually says in a couple of different places that we don't have the authority to prohibit, regulate, or charge for co-locations other than as specified in the bill. It'll cause problems. I mean, we'll, and we'll deal with them. And it looks like the state won't, but they'll. Uh, yeah, and the, the more dense the area is, the more poles are going to be in. So we'll see in downtown, we'll see in uh, lots of our neighborhoods. So I'm not looking forward to the prospect of that. But on the other, the other hand, the one good thing about it is we'll see less tall tower. We won't have those big things on the horizon, but That's it'll correct. still be problematic. Thank you to the legislature. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, further questions? Is there any discussion? Is there a motion? No, it's not. If there's no motion, nothing comes out of committee. Well, let me ask a question. If we do nothing, uh, state ordinances will apply mm -hmm. regardless. I mean, you know. The state the, statutes would the, apply. The state statutes we have the apply. option of doing some limited regulation, as Ms. Gunthold indicated, under the, or, under the statute. Under the but statute. if we do nothing, then the state statute determines yeah. and, what they and do. And so we have we pushed it as far as we can push it uh, with our own agendas. Historic districts, obviously, I'm incredibly concerned about. Yes, sir. And you think that we can proceed under that agreement, that we will not have those in our Old Salem historical areas? Yes, well, one of the provisions of the House bill says that we can, uh, it, it specifies the basis for denial of an application for a co-location. One of those is for failure to comply with applicable historic preservation requirements. And those are specified. They have to be compliant with another section of statute, et cetera. But there is language in there about that. Okay. Well, I think we have to make a motion and move forward. All right. Well, a motion to approve the draft uh, that is before us. Um, uh, is there a second, or Ms. Trailer, do you want to ask a question first? 
Uh, I think another option, Mr. Chairman, might be to send this forward without a recommendation. Um, I just don't particularly like the idea of having to do something or there, are, there is no regulation. So it doesn't seem like the people or the council get much of a say in what happens here. So the other option, instead of putting a, a motion and a second on the floor, might be to send it forward without a recommendation. Well, that would be a, 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 a motion to send forward without a recommendation. Uh, Mr. Larson, would you accept that as a friendly amendment? Well, I, I think there's a very narrow window of opportunity here to provide a certain amount of controls on this matter. And it looks like staff has pushed it as far as they can. So sending it forward with no recommendation unless we want to fight the state on the whole matter, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure that we, we get anywhere on this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this one little victory that we seem to have in some control and, and I'm going to go ahead and say we're going to live with that and we're going to have to follow state ordinance otherwise. All right. So that, that's, uh, that's retaining the, uh, exactly. a favorable recommendation. And if I can't get a second, then nothing happens. Yeah. So there we go. But hopefully I, I see no reason to hold it up at this point. Mr. Chairman, you feel free to give a second? I'll give a second. Just, all right. Uh, discussion? Yes. The ordinance that we're talking about here does is if we don't do this then, then there are less there's less say that we have in the process am i correct i believe that's right yes we've tried to insert some things into the ordinance that give us some additional discretion fill in a few gaps right. that kind of thing so yeah. it's to our benefit it's to the local municipalities benefit to pass this ordinance i think so because we track the state statute requirements uh, where necessary but then we address some additional issues. For example, one of the things we're allowed to do is specify the form and content of the application. And so in the ordinance, we have set out uh, kind of an extensive list of the things we require to be in the application in order to consider that we have a completed application on which to act. So that, that's one of the benefits, I guess I'd say. <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like something Darth Vader would say. <laughs> That's an apropos comparison. Um, all right, uh, then if there's no further discussion, uh, those in favor of the motion, please vote yes. Any opposed, vote no. Or abstain, but you know, push abstain. And we have two yeses and one abstention. It goes forward uh, with positive recommendation. Will this automatically happen? Who didn't vote? To the, on the general agenda, yes. Uh, will this have a hearing or not? It's not, no, it's not, it's not scheduled. scheduled for hearing. All right. So, is, would this be next week, Monday? Yes. Mm -hmm. Ma'am. All right. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'd like to make one additional comment. I understand from the league that there's going to be more opportunity to go back in the next three or four sessions uh, for tweaks to the bill. Um, so, it's the window's not entirely closed if we find that the bill is unworkable and we still want to make some further or, or advocate for some further revisions to the law. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, if, yes. I, if I could add something, the timing is important because there's a sense that as soon as people start putting in polls, they're gonna, there's going to be a land grab. And so there's going to be a big rush at the beginning of the availability of this window. And so once all those polls are set, we're, you know, the, the deal's going to be done. So uh, to me, it makes more sense to have this ordinance in effect up front as soon as possible. Yes. Yes, Council. Okay, so if it goes forward uh, with a positive recommendation, uh, two in favor, none opposed, one abstaining. Let's move to item G3, please. Item G3, update on Wednesday settlement for Scythe County School System bond project proposed improvements to the Northwest Boulevard. All right, thank you. I understand uh, from uh, Mr. Turner that uh, presenting the information will be Mr. John Davenport. You'll come forward and introduce your colleague to us, please. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, Yes, I'm John Davenport, 305 West 4th Street, Winston Salem, North Carolina. And I have with Frank Amenia with me. And um, Frank will be doing the technical piece of it, make it look good. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll do the same thing with him on the next presentation. Right. Um, get it up. Thank you. All right, so the, um, we were asked to bring an update on the uh, Northwest Boulevard project that the uh, school system has hired us to work on. And I just want to give you an overview of the, uh, the goals of the project. Uh, first of all, a safer pedestrian crossing. Uh, if you all are aware, there was an accident out there uh, the last school year <clears throat> where a student got hit, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we get into some of the remedies. Um, but we have a lot of uh, crossings and people parking on both sides of the roads. So it's, it's just 
it's a street, but it's actually a sidewalk, a linear sidewalk at the same time. So we want to work on that and try to increase safety. Um, Mr. Chairman, I just note, I see some of you are looking at your iPad. We got a longer version of the presentation earlier today, and then Mr. Davenport and his staff went back and distilled it down. So uh, there's more information in your online packages, but this is going to be a shorter version. So. We're going to give you a short one. I know how you like it. Appreciate it. <laughs> Good thing. <laughs> Improve the efficiency and safety during pickup and drop off. You know, there's between Wiley and Reynolds, there's a lot of cars out there during the peak hours. Minimize the darting out of pedestrian crossings. Improve st uh, student channelization and waiting areas. Uh, move parent pickup lanes, uh, lines of sight to improve overall uh, traffic safety. We will, uh, the design does incorporate some traffic calming. Uh, we did want to maintain the bike lanes which are out there the city invested in, as well as maximizing parking. Right now, parking is on both sides, it's parallel parking. And so um, what we want to do, we got a video for you. Uh, I know you all like those too. <laughs> Everybody uh, likes to see things now. So instead of me doing as much talking, I can kind of talk through the video. But um, it's not there. Remember, we got to go to YouTube and bring it. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so we'll start the video and kind of give you a tour of what we're proposing on Northwest Boulevard. We'll start up at the, um, the intersection up towards Hawthorne and we'll move to the uh, east. Uh, so first, you know, the video just kind of orients you to everything. There's Reynolds on the north side of the road, Wiley on the south, and of course you see Haynes Park, uh, which we didn't identify, but it's, it's clear there. Um, as we zoom in, one of the things that we are proposing, a lot of the activity is going to take place at Wiley. That's where a lot of the, currently, um, the interaction between pedestrians and vehicles occurs. So um, as this starts, one of the first things we looked at, it was reconfiguring the parking lot that's on the left. And I'll pause just one second so you can see. Um, we're going to be uh, in adding some additional parking out there. Uh, and if you see, there's a lane here. This is just an emergency relief valve uh, currently um, to get people. And it's not currently there, but to allow people to get out if there were an incident at the main entrance. Um, as we move along the roadway, you'll see that we've uh, improved the parking. Um, as we get closer to Wiley itself, I'll pause here, um, you'll see that we are proposing a, a staggered crossing. So currently right now there's no median, there's, you just cross and, and we have crossing guards that are there. Uh, we still would need a crossing guard in this situation, but this would be a two-stage crossing. You would cross one side of the roadway, you'd have the safety of the median, and then you would be forced to then cross the second side. Uh, the incident that occurred out there um, uh, last school year, there was a student that actually was trying to cross all the lanes at one time mm -hmm. right at the school guard crossing guard got off and, and got clipped by a vehicle. So this type of uh, treatment would minimize that type of action happening because they'd be forced to cross halfway and then cross again. Yes, sir. Mr. Are you going to have any physical uh, barrier to a student simply deciding that he or she was going to continue straight across? Yes, it's, it's going to be, this is going to be a raised median and there'll be uh, plantings and things in there to, right, so to dissuade people to from. Require them basically to do the dog. Work. That's correct. Okay. Yep. That is correct. And so uh, we deem that to be a, a safer crossing than currently what's out there. Uh, but along with that, the benefit of a left turn lane into the site. Um, one other thing I'll mention also, currently the traffic uh, that's going into Wiley is mainly sits on Northwest Boulevard. One of the directions that the school board gave us was to accommodate all of our traffic for the school on school campus and not on the city street. So the, the parking lot being expanded allows us to be able to accommodate that traffic there and those parents on school property and not sitting on the, the roadway. As we continue uh, to the east, you know, we've got a reconfigured uh, bus lot that's there on the left. Um, one of the things that also you can see is, is maybe a little bit difficult, but there is a, a pedestrian way that we are, it's a sidewalk, but we're actually proposing to pull that sidewalk back onto school property 
and put a fence between that sidewalk and the roadway itself. We don't really want students crossing except where we want them to cross. And so this area here is where the tunnel is. And I'll let it scroll up just a little bit further. So that fence will be electrified? <laughs> <laughs> no, please. No. no, we're not going to do that. But, <laughs> but it will encourage uh, folks to, um, when they come out of the tunnel and when they're in those areas, to cross where we want them to cross and not uh, just inadvertently the way they do now. Um, and actually, that fence uh, continues for the entire distance from here all the way down to uh, Renota. As we go past the gym, one of the things that you'll notice uh, that we'll highlight here that is be a first for the city and would actually require an ordinance change. Currently out there, you have parallel parking on both sides of the road. What we have discussed with city staff internally is the notion of a, what is called reverse angle parking with a median down the middle of Northwest Boulevard. That median is about as a four foot concrete median, so it's not very substantial but enough to keep people, if they're coming westbound on Northwest Boulevard, from pulling in the parking spaces the wrong way. Um, there are a lot of studies that have shown, and, these, and, and this has been implemented in other areas, that, uh, that reverse angle parking is, is actually safer than, angle, than um, parallel parking. You have a lot of movements you have to do with parallel parking. It does seem natural because that's the way we grew up with the cones and everybody backing in, but you know, if you're under 30, they don't even make you parallel park anymore uh, when you get your license. I understand, but this reverse angle, uh, when you back into the space, you're automatically, your door, when you open the door, you're, you're just forcing you back to the sidewalk. So you're not interacting with the vehicles. If there's anything going on, it's all back towards the sidewalk. And when you get ready to pull out, you're already facing the right direction. So we have a video on that. We're not going to show that to you tonight, but uh, we've talked to staff about that, and that's what we're discussing. We have a public meeting tomorrow. Uh, with the, the parents and so on in the area. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Yes, sir. Mr. Davenport, I'm not very familiar with the concept of reverse angle parking. Mm -hmm. so if you have that information, I'd be happy to, to see it. Absolutely. Send it to me. I, I, have, yeah. I want to look at it. Thank you. Well, yeah, Greg and, and his team have that, and we can uh, certainly show that to you. Do you, do you have um, uh, a concept for what happens when you got the less skillful driver who backs into the door of uh, the car that's parked next to them. Are they going to end up blocking the lane for a substantial time or what? You say when they back into? Yeah, basically, you know, the, the, the person whose backing skill is less than completely refined. Right. Um, and so uh, they kind of end up scraping down the side of the car. Is there enough space for uh, them to Get out and is there enough room for vehicles to yeah, get, get around, around there's them. a problem? The, the answer is yes. Okay. We've made it wide enough for vehicles to, to get around. That was one of the issues that the city asked us to take a look at as we yeah. were designing this. Thank you. That's a good question. Though. Uh, the, and like I said, in other areas, the median has not been applied. That's something that the city staff thought would be apropos here because this would be the first time it's done. And, um, you know, keeping everybody in it, uh, keeping the folks doing the right thing instead of coming up the road and just saying, I'm just going to cut across and pull in like it's throughway. So. All right. So as we continue, um, it's more of the same. The, the parking count with all these changes, we actually end up with eight additional spaces and they're currently out there now. So even making the changes and moving the parking to one side uh, with the changes and the additional to the parking lot over at Wiley, we have a total of 253 spaces, excuse me, 235 spaces that are available. Um, so that was another issue that we were asked to make sure we take a look at. We know a lot of people utilize the park and the other facilities out there that the city has, and we did not want that this safety project to, um, and actually let me pause one thing also. I know you guys were talking about handicapped parking. We also were able to add some of those Good. Uh, very close to the softball fields. I think those are, is it four spaces? Yes. So those currently don't exist now, so you do have four spaces there for that. So uh, we feel. Wait, we added more on the bus. Yeah, those are for the school. Mm -hmm. so this is, these are public that anybody could use. So we feel like that with this uh, concept, we've tried to meet the, the requirements of everyone that was at the table. Um, we did speak with the North Carolina Department of Transportation. They did not necessarily feel like they had to have a voice in this. 
uh, because it is a city street, and although um, <coughs> there'll be detour traffic on it during the business 40 closure, the only stipulation that they put on the school system is to have this done before the closure happens. So consequently, we need to talk with the city and everybody, stakeholders, and make sure everyone agrees so we can get this design finished and uh, get it constructed by next fall. Are there any questions? Um, no right-of-way acquisition. We're entirely within the boundaries. We have no need yeah. to, okay. Curb lines, are we expanding curb lines in this? Yeah, that's another good thing. That one, of the re one of the things that we try to do to expedite this project is not move the curb lines right. any or have to deal with right-of-way. The, just like your problem you're having with 7th Street, Norfolk Southern owns this railroad through here, and, and, and we very quickly decided we don't want to move any poles, we don't want to touch anything that belongs to Norfolk Southern. Mm -hmm. The same reason you're still held up on 7th Street. We'll never meet our schedule right. if we have to deal with those things. And when is this work supposed to happen? We need to have it in place by next fall. In, in place? Yeah. By this see. fall or next 18? Fall. Next 18. 18? Yes, sir. By the time Business 40 closes. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. Who's funding this project? This is funded by the bonds that the school system floated in 2014, 16, 16. Yeah. The bond issue. Yep. 100 percent by the and, 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 and the concept of 16 year olds backing into a space like that just still kind of blows my mind. I mean, the evidence that we have that this works it, it was any of the any of that evidence from a similar situation where you've got a young population um, trying to do this? And it just, it, it's, just it, it's new. It, it just seems problematic to me. It, it absolutely is new. You know, the, when you start thinking about backing, of course, I had the same uh, anxiety when I first think about it, but if you're backing into a parallel space, you're backing. And when you're backing into a parallel space, you've got to make several movements. Now, if you're good, you can do that in two turns. If you're 16 years old, maybe not so. So in terms of the, the risk of there being more of a crash situation out there, I don't think this is a lot different than trying to parallel park. I think, I think there's some great advantages actually in this because pulling out is going to be much safer. Yes. I think, and you do have your bike rack or your bike lane sort of buffering to give you a little more maneuvering space. How wide are the are these parking spaces as wide or wider than a normal uh, straight pull in or ten foot usually is what we deal with with that? No, they're they're deeper than ten. I mean, they're I think it's twenty. I'm not talking about deep. I'm talking about wide. I'm talking about pulling in. Do we have how wide are these spaces? Are they nine nine feet. I think so. The typical space is nine foot, and the city standards would be nine foot so, trees so, as well. So, example, those that we were pulling in straight on, on those on those parking spaces, those are all nine foot. The ones in the parking lot are nine would be nine foot. The parallel spaces are probably less than nine feet. They're on the road right now. now I'm just talking uh, about the maneuvering space, space of coming in in an angled space, whether you're pulling in straight or whether you're backing up, the width of those parking spaces is going to be the same as what you're telling me. Correct. Mm -hmm. A normal, now when I say normal, it's for a regular car. A compact space is eight and a half feet wide, but a normal space is nine feet wide. Nine feet. And whether it's angle or 90 degree, uh, it's in that range. The, the design will meet the standards of the city engineers that are reviewing it. I mean, it's, it's your road, and so whatever the... the Robert and his team and, and Denise dictate we'll make sure that it's safe for you know meets the safety standards of the city. Ms. Bright, how many angled spaces are there on the street? Uh, it's a hundred and forty-five. No, eighty-six. It's eighty-six reverse angles, one hundred and forty-five, and then the new parking lot. So if you added a foot to each one, you'd lose about eight ish. Good, yeah, which puts you back down to your number that you have now. I personally feel more comfortable with <laughs> the 10 foot we'll space instead of a 9 foot space. Room. That's, on, what I, that's where I was going with it. Based on the population. Yeah, we, we're not, this is the concept. We can, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, we, we, if that's what it takes, 
to, to make sure everybody feels good about it. We'll and, and this goes, this goes, there's a public meeting tomorrow night where. That's right. There's a public input meeting tomorrow night. And then Island. my understanding is there's actually an ordinance change that the city would have to approve in order to allow. That's, that's really kind of why this is before us now. That's right. You actually would have to get the vote on it. Yes. All right. Any other feedback? I think it's a great concept. Um, so I'm happy that they've got Davenport looking into it, and I think overall it'd be better for traffic in the area. So, I, I, I had a little mini tutorial about reverse angle parking just now. Oh, so I feel a little bit more comfortable about it. <laughs> yeah. right. it, it, it takes a little bit of time to think about. Mm -hmm. and I, I do think the city staff and their recommendations have, you know, when we pulled, pulled everything together, we came up with something I feel like is workable in this area with students. Uh, with you know, putting the median in, the bike lanes, which do provide the additional buffering. So that those lanes, if, if you've been on Northwest Boulevard, it is a very wide road. And so part of the calming is we're going to be striping it down to use the, better utilize the pavement. But there is a lot of pavement mm -hmm. to let people move around and, and maneuver. Okay. Yes. I, I appreciate um, you know, the desire to pick up eight spaces. Uh, but I think in your conversations with the users, uh, if you're going to go to actually talk about the students and the families that are going to be using this, you might throw out the option as to whether or not they would rather have a little wider spaces to get into or whether they'd like to have the eight spaces, additional parking, and just let them know that, you know, this is a, this is an area of discussion. Um, and see which, you know, which they feel more comfortable with. I, I do tend to, because it is a new concept, and because they are backing in and all that. I know we got radar and all kinds of things now to help us navigate these cars. Mm -hmm. But, you know, because it's so different, a little extra space may uh, uh, preclude accidents that the four park, the eight parking spaces, um, the balance is still better for us not to have the accidents. So I, I would just throw that to the users and let them, let them sort of say, what do you guys feel about that? And then get some feedback. I, I, that's certainly a good recommendation, and you know, like I said, we gained seven or eight spaces. So if we if we're able to lose a few of them and get back down to what you have now, I don't think that's a, a crisis for anyone. Okay. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. guys. Uh, and with that, I think we are in position to move to item G four, please. Item G4, information regarding the professional engineering firm for the Whitaker Park Akron Drive Extension Visibility Study. All right, and I think this uh, continues to be you gentlemen. We're going to let Frank take over now. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Thank you very much um, for having us here. It's an opportunity to work on a project like this um, within the city. So last year, we were asked by the City Department of Transportation to um, carry out a feasibility study to determine the best way to provide direct route from US 52 via Akron Drive into the site of the former RJR with a car park plant. The goal for this extension um, was to really enhance development opportunities at the Wete Car Park um, site and the surrounding area through providing um, an improved access and connectivity. Currently, as um, you can see, um, if you are coming from 52 and you want to head to the Wete Car Park, you would have to make a left onto Reynolds Boulevard which is not very direct to the Wither Car Park. And so our goal was to find out what direct route can we provide. This study process um, involved collaboration with um, city staff. Um, we looked at 10 concepts with city staff and after going through each one of them, um, we had four that were viable for us to go ahead and present to the public. We did have a um, public information meeting that was in January um, this year. The first one was the free flow connection to Reynolds Boulevard with an overpass. So what you see here has a more direct route 
from Reno, from Akron Drive with an overpass over Indiana Avenue, which connects directly, and the railroad, which connects straight into, um, onto Reynolds Boulevard. You can tell we had to tread the needle because we have the um, Haynes Hosiery um, Community Park, which was um, constructed using federal funds, and so we cannot really touch it. And then we also have the package lines um, industry. And so we had to really try as much as possible not to impact those, um, those facilities in any way. For the parking um, lines industry, we would, be able, we would be impacting it, but it wouldn't be that much. And the owner was at the public meeting um, to see our concept. The advantage for this particular concept is, one, it provides the direct access. It reduces impact <coughs> to the parking lines industry and then the Haynes Hosiery Community Center. And it provides the east-west connection to University Boulevard um, from 52. It was also one of our low-cost um, alternative. Um, in terms of disadvantages, it will eliminate the existing intersection of Akron Drive and Indiana Avenue because we would have to reroute traffic through Perimeter Boulevard. Um, it impacts a historic building, which is within the Whitaker Park, and it restricts the remainder of the um, Reynolds Boulevard to a right in right out at the intersection with uh, the Akron Drive extension. Um, the approximate cost is a little bit over $24 million. This is the second concept, and this is just like the other one I just showed, only that in this case it provides a direct connection to chauffeur drive. This, was, this has the same um, advantages. The only thing that is more superior with this um, concept is, one, it provides access, direct access from 52 to destinations on chauffeur drive, including the fairgrounds and then the Wake Forest University athletic um, fields. It also provides a greater developable area as compared to the others and it preserves the historic building on um, Whittaker Park. And it was the lowest um, cost. In terms of disadvantage, the only one we have here is, again, the intersection of Akron Drive and Indiana. Um, the existing intersection would go away and we'll have to reroute um, traffic. The approximate cost is a little bit over $21 million. The third concept is relocating Akron Drive with an overpass mm. over Indiana Avenue and also the railroad track, and then directly um, connecting Reynolds Boulevard. This mm. option, um, you can tell, would impact a lot of development um, just north of the parking um, industry and um, it, it, was, it has the high you know, cost. And um, the other thing we also realized was um, it will not provide the direct access from US 52 to Whitaker Park. In terms of advantages, um, it would still maintain the, the intersection of Indiana Avenue and Akron Drive is still going to be maintained. Um, you wouldn't have any impact at all on the Hosiery um, Community Center, but just a little bit on the um, parking um, lines in the industry. And it's, the, the other advantage is it's well aligned um, in events, the existing interchange on 52 has to be modified. The cost, like I said, is um, mm. close to $40 million. Mm -hmm. The last concept is the intersection bridge 
of Akron Drive and Indiana Avenue. Um, what this concept does is coming from Akron, it's raised on a bridge, and then also coming from Indiana, it all intersects um, on a bridge. Like you have um, for some interchanges, like a simple, a single point um, interchange. But in this case, what happens is it all meets at, on top over the railroad crossing. This provides the direct route from 52 to Wedeka Park. Um, it maintains the intersection of Indiana Avenue and Akron Drive. But the disadvantage we had for this was the steep grades because we have to raise and have walls um, beside the roads. Um, we also had site distance issue and this has the highest cost um, which is also around um, a little bit more than the 39 uh, million, close to 40 million dollars. So we presented all this um, at our meeting, public meeting, and the relocated Akron Drive with the overpass was um, not favorable by um, the folks that, the stakeholders and folks that really came to the meeting. Um, the intersection bridge was also not favorable. Um, felt, people felt it was too expensive and um, the design features, um, it was not liked. And then we had the two to choose from, which is a free flow connection to Reynolds Boulevard with the overpass and then the free flow connection to Chauffeur with the overpass. Um, the free flow connection to um, Reynolds was struck down um, because one, it did not have a lot of developable area. And then two, it was also going to impact the historic buildings within the Wheeler car park. And um, it was, the, the other thing was um, folks felt it didn't, they would rather prefer a direct route to Chauffeur Drive, which connected to the fair, um, fairgrounds and then the um, Wake Forest athletic fields. And so, um, based on the fact that it has the lowest cost, highly favored by the stakeholders, more developable areas, preserving historic um, buildings on Wheeler Car Park, this option, um, which provides, provides direct connection to chauffeur drive, um, was recommended um, for further study. The next steps um, for this study is to coordinate with NCDOT and uh, Winston Salem MPO to uh, make sure that um, this gets into the um, TIP process. It would involve, it will also need a, a full environmental study. It would need community impact study. It will need a full blown um, traffic impact study design documents and additional public meetings in order to be able to have this project in fusion. At this time, we are ready for any questions. Questions? Well, it's a very ambitious project. Um, do we, <laughs> do we anticipate? Yes, it is. Uh, yes, it is. But I'm sure that, that the people that are developing Whitaker Park are very excited to see that connection created to, to US 52. And I'm sure everybody that goes to the football games or to Wake Forest athletic programs, Coliseum, are glad to have the connection that we have so long needed. Uh, I guess the question is, who pays for it? We're going to put it on the tip. Are we expecting some state funding on this one? Yeah, uh, absolutely going to need that. And what kind of schedule do you think this is realistically five years out? What, I mean, where are we? Do you have any ideas as to when this might, we might look forward to having this expedited access? Good evening, members of the committee. Good evening. As far as the schedule, we don't have one. What we would do is we would recommend it uh, as a part, one of our projects in the uh, TIP process, which is P5 coming up, uh, which the, uh, the state would actually uh, vote and select projects 
next year. Mm -hmm. So if, that pro if the project is selected, then it would go into the scheduling of projects that they put forth. So it could be anywhere within a four to five year period, or it could be scheduled for uh, years out. So this is actually a state road that we're dealing with? No, well, sir. It's a city street. It's a city street, but we are able to put projects in into, to, right. into their process to request uh, state funding. I appreciate avoiding the historic building. Thank you for doing that. All right. Like Ms. Adams. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I want to thank Davenport's uh, organization for helping us to get to this point. Uh, We've been, as you know, Whitaker Park Development Authority, and I sit on that board to represent the council. As you know, it is in the North Ward. And we look at this no different than Union Park and other areas of development, Peters Creek. If we want to make this one of these places that we have placed at the top of our strategic plan for the city, we now got to be able to get businesses in and out to be able to move their product and services as well as their employees. When it was originally built, just like what we have now, or when it was back in the 60s, it was a good idea. But now we got to make some changes to be able to pull people off of 52, Highway 52, with all of the uh, improvements going there for it to become interstate, what, 74? 74, so that we can capitalize on that as well. As everyone knows, we are trying to grow this project to help us bring back up to 10,000 jobs in the next five to 10 years. So I've seen this, and I'm sure Councilmember Bessie has too, on the Transportation Advisory Committee's agenda now. We've seen it for a while. Uh, I'm thinking it'll probably be there when we go back Thursday for our meeting. And uh, this project has been moving very fast. Uh, I think we have a lot of support uh, from the state and others, and I wouldn't be surprised if this project is not fast tracked very quickly. Again, thank okay. you. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move into item number G5. Item G5 information regarding drainage concerns of property owners along Castle Street. Castle Street. Castle. Cassell Street. Um, and so we will take item G5. Mr. Turner, would you give us the updated background on what has been done and what options staff uh, has looked at? Certainly, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, as you recall, the residents of the area came to the committee, expressed concerns about the history of stormwater and erosion that problems that they've had at their property. The city went back and looked at the availability of funding from other sources and also looked at whether there were any legal remedies that the property owners could pursue with development uh, developers or others uh, who may have contributed to the problem. And finally, we looked at any revisions that the city council could make to its own policies to assist the residents with this type of problem. We did not find that there were any viable options from other sources like the Clean Water Management Trust Fund or FEMA or other agencies that have traditionally provided funding for this type of activity. We also weren't able to find anything that indicated that there were any legal solutions that uh, were available to the citizens to pursue. Uh, but we did identify that if City Council wished to change its policy, on participation in stormwater repair projects on private property that you had an option and that would involve changing what we euphemistically call your 7030 program to provide a mechanism for a higher city participation if the median income value of houses in an area was less than the city median average and if that was the case then the op the policy would allow for going to 80 20 where the city would be paying 80% of the cost and the property owners 20% of the cost. Finally, under that um, additional revisions you can make to the policy, you would be able to consider a uh, payback period over 10 years instead of the current five-year period. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about the optional op uh, policy. Uh, one question, and then to my colleagues. Um, was there a reason to simply make it a, 
a flat if you're less than the median value as opposed to if you're up to X percentage of the median value? We were just trying to keep it simple. We're open to any options that the committee wishes to give us back. All right, other questions? Um, comment. Mr. Taylor, yes, comment. Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you, Mr. Turner, for going back and taking a look at that and for the committee. And to the neighbors who are here, I apologize that you had to wait to this point in the meeting to have this heard, but I appreciate your patience. I had an opportunity to speak with the neighbors before the meeting, and naturally I think they were uh, hoping that the city would come back and be willing to participate at 100 percent. I think now that you know, they sort of understand that that might not be the case, I think they are satisfied with moving forward with the 80 percent, the 80-20 uh, program, uh, and evaluating whether or not they will fit the criteria for that, and also as opposed to five years for the payback period, moving it to 10 years. I think they think it'll be a little bit helpful for the neighbors. I think another thing they were disappointed in that the city, you know, couldn't work with them to hold some of the other landlords or property owners accountable if they did not want to participate. Because I think their concern was if one neighbor did it and the other two beside them did not, that it would be sort of counterproductive. But I think they're somewhat satisfied with moving forward uh, with the changes. So I'd ask that we uh, review the concept of a policy change to go with the 80-20 rule based on median income and the, the 10 years versus the five-year payback uh, term. Other questions or comments? I, I, I don't have, well, I, I do have a question in a sense. Um, I, I am inclined to definitely support an 80-20 program. I, I, I think other municipalities uh, have done that um, to help support uh, properties. You know how I have raised the questions about uh, wa city water running across personal property, and I, I think I've raised that question on two occasions about stormwater that we have piped across individuals' properties that have now caused cave-ins or sinkholes. I've got another example of that in my ward uh, where we have city street water running across and we have a sinkhole from a collapsed pipe. And, and these are surprises to homeowners, are surprising to these people who have now find big gullies in their backyard. Uh, I would I would rather us make it just a formal policy to change our standards from uh, a, a 30 70 universally to a 2080 period uh, regardless of whether uh, economic basis of, of the individual property being impacted um, I certainly hear that um, uh, the um, the thing that we do have to keep in mind of course is that we what we do for one individual, we have to do for every similarly situated individual. Uh, and we're talking about potentially a, a significant tax increase on every property owner in the city. That is we, mm, may I? You know, we, this, well, let's, let's get down to the basis of this argument. And, and that is, you know, our city's responsibility is to provide services uh, for the welfare of the citizens. Mm -hmm. Part of what we do is provide road streets and whatever. You know, we have at some point decided that we can take water that comes off of our public streets and pipe it across private property without the land uh, landlord or the, uh, the, uh, the owner of the property even knowing about it. And these pipes exist under people's property lines and they buy their houses, there's nothing in the deeds, there's nothing to warn them that this is occurring. Uh, there's no mapping, there's nothing in the city that tells them that they're at peril, and one day they wake up and there's a sinkhole and they, own 30, they owe 30,000, 20,000, 15,000 to the city to repair something that's shown up in their yard. Now, you know, as, as a property owner, as an individual in the city, uh, this just astonishes me uh, that we can have a situation where you know the city is at fault now if if the, if the stream that's been uh, put in a culvert because you know a natural phenomena but so many of these cases that we see that i've seen and just in the six months that i've been here you know are, are matters where storm water is being piped across private property in pipes that who knows when they went in but the city is using those pipes now to move water off of public streets and and if we're going to do an 80 if we're going to do a 70-30, saying basically that 30% of the responsibility is for a pipe that's under somebody's house. And I've often wondered, and this is to the city attorney, to get down into this matter. If, if I go back into my property line and I throw a sack of concrete in front of that pipe that's broken and causing a sinkhole in my yard, 
and I say, I'm not going to let the city run water across my yard anymore. There is no easement. We, ha we have nothing in the deed. We have nothing to say that I understand that says that we have the right to even do that. So, and, and so what I'm trying to understand is how to equitably handle all of this uh, in, in a way, I understand we're talking money here. Well, I'm not, I'm not suggesting full responsibility, but I know there are other municipalities that are doing full 2080 on this thing. And, and I'm trying to understand, you know, how we've decided that we're going to put this burden on our, on our individual citizens. It's, gr it's great if you're a tax, but you say, well, it's going to raise our tax base. But if you're an individual that has a sinkhole showing up in their backyard and you've got to drop $15,000 to get it fixed, you know, you're being taxed by, you're getting taxed by the city to do that. Actually, I think it's important to look at the physical realities <clears throat> and what has happened. Um, what you're talking about is not water that the city has created, nor, nor water that the city has routed. What you're talking about, uh, the original developer of the property, private developer of the property, um, has taken what was a surface flow uh, or a channeled flow uh, and piped it underneath the structure that they put in or underneath the, um, the yard that they have, uh, they have developed. Um, they did that uh, without city uh, public uh, funds um, and this is the standard situation in older communities uh, around the state. Um, and what uh, it would be pooling in their yards and their basements uh, and that would not be city water, that would be uh, natural water that happens to be uh, flowing where it used to flow, except now there's no channel and now it's in their homes. Now, Mr. Chairman, yes. I, I am, I'm talking very specifically about curb and gutter, storm drain water coming off the streets of Winston-Salem being piped into pipes at storm drains that are, go that are crossing private property right now. And I can take you into West Salem and I can show you a very specific example of exactly that going to a city manhole on the back side of this piece of property that where that water is being transported to and when that pipe failed that's bringing the from the storm drain on the on the street to that manhole that's taking it to god knows where and that pipe failed the individual property owner is now being asked to fix that that water is not coming from a natural spring if anything it's coming you know it's coming from the sky but it's coming on city property and we're moving it off of our curb line through a storm drain onto private property. That's what we're doing. And there's nothing, there's no easement in that guy's property um, deeds, and there's no recognition of that in anything that would warn him when he bought that house that there's even a line going through his house. It's probably 20 feet deep in his property. Well, let's ask the engineer. Mr. Turner, uh, is this a matter of water that has been diverted by the city onto uh, private property, or is it a matter that uh, the, the previous uh, flow uh, of the water in that area took that, uh, that low spot across that property. In general, the majority of water that comes onto the public streets and then flows into the catch basins and then onto other private property is coming off of private property to begin with. The city's roadway system is a conveyance that is basically transferring the water across the natural drainage way that it used to take. So if you had virgin territory, there would be creeks and streams. When development comes in and develops that area, then a road is built, and that road has to transport that water underneath in order to keep from flooding. And so generally, the water systems the city is managing are capturing water from off-site. Now, there is a certain amount of impervious surface that's associated with that roadway, and that water is also conveyed off of the road and into that same drainage system. But in general, the city's drainage systems storm drainage systems are taking advantage of the natural topography and drainage systems that were in place before any development occurred. Now, I'll be happy to look into the specific situation that Councilmember Larson is referring to, but that's the general rule. Yeah. Because the, the specific piping that occurs on one person's property and may be servicing 15 houses up and down the street, the liability of that one pipe that goes across his property is his expense if he has to fix it. That pipe is five feet from his neighbor's property. The neighbor's property is not having to pay $15,000 to get this thing fixed. He has to pay it. And that water may be of benefit for all up and down the street, you can say that, but the individual property owner who has, again, that pipe had to be put in by the city. 
it was it was attached it's attached and this is this is way off topic from from what we we're talking about but it does relate to the to the 2080 question that I'm that I'm raising and whether or not this city is going to accept more responsibility for the infrastructure to move water around in this in this city I am all for you know helping residents deal with with water issues but if we're going to do it and, and realistically particularly with the piping of water you know on, on personal property that impacts one property owner, you know, disproportionately. And we talk about tax bases, we talk about cost to this thing. Those, those property owners who, again, are, are subject to incredible expenditures with no warning in their deeds or anything, somehow or another the city's gone around and put in these pipes on people's personal property. Um, and I'm I can, sorry, Mr. This, Larson. This is exactly where I want you to take a look at it, because we have no mapping, apparently. For, and this is not the first time this question's been raised about, oh, well, the, this, this property is a pipe that's going across somebody's personal property. And, and then when the pipe fails, it's 30% their problem. So okay. it, a lot of those pipes are put in by developers, so there are actually five pipes that you're referring to, and we would not have records of those if they're not part of our inventory. If this pipe, and we'll, we will we'll talk offline about this specific example, yeah, we'll because there, there may be categories that deal with the thing. I am in favor of an 80-20 split, and I'm perfectly happy to support that, because I think eventually it addresses a variety of problems that deals with water issues, whether it be erosion. This is what we're paying our stormwater runoff questions about anyway. This is where that money should be going. Uh, we, we're, every water bill, you put money into that, and, and somehow or another, you know, if, that's, if those are the causes of problems, then, then the water runoff funds should help address that. I don't know how much money we've got. I don't know whether the Utilities Commission needs to look at that again, you know, or whatever. But if, we, if we're consistently having these problems with water runoff, mm -hmm. then, then we need to look at the source, you know, and, and seek revenues to fix that. All right. Other questions or comments? Yes. Mr. Turner. Yes, sir. How often in situations like, in situations like these do we have creeks encroaching upon the front or backyards of neighbors uh, who live in particular communities? We have them throughout the city, oh, council member. So um, I, I know we've had them before, but is this a frequent request? I would say we at least get one a month uh, where someone has a severe erosion problem. Whether it's as severe as this, where it's actually threatening the back of the houses, no. But we probably have one request a month for someone calling us about a severe erosion problem. I think for me, I'm going to stand up and speak for the people I represent 10 times out of 10, and I'm going to do that today. But it's a simple case of equity versus equality. Uh, equality is sort of giving everybody the same thing, 80-20, 70-30. But I think sometimes it's incumbent upon cities to practice a little bit of equity. You know, if someone makes $500,000 a year, holding them to the same standard as somebody who makes $20,000 a year, I think we have to be a little bit more fair and favorable in this city. So uh, I think this community, if we look at the, medium, the median home values, and, and even if it's a, a, a pilot program, and, it, and it's, a, it's below a certain median home value, I think we support the neighborhood with 80-20. Uh, naturally, they, they want the city to pay 100% of the costs. I think they understand, based on our conversations and based on the conversations at this table, that that may not happen. Some other state agency, FEMA or somebody, Diener may step up in the future, but they're not there. But I think 80-20, even as a pilot program, is something that this community needs, and I'm prepared to stand up and fight for it. I understand where everyone is. Sounds like it's two to two. <laughs> or, no, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to support that. Well, I, I'd make the motion, and that's, that's further conversation that, that's needed. Uh, if I may, I think that the motion in this case would be asked. Plus for information ask staff to prepare a draft uh, that would incorporate the 80-20 uh, with a 10-year uh, payback option uh, for, um, uh, for neighborhoods or project areas. Uh, which one was it, project area or neighborhood? Uh, the project area would be what we would evaluate against the city overall right. in calculating so, the, what yeah, tier they're That's even better. Yeah, below the average um, uh, or the median. Uh, Correct. Property value. Um, and uh, uh, that is similar to the approach that we took with street paving right. for annex neighborhoods. That's correct. Where there was a, a sliding scale opportunity taking into account 
the capacity of the neighbors to uh, to participate. Correct. Um, which I think is a reasonable approach. And I think that's what we're asking here today, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, um, I will continue to push back against the thought that uh, the private pipes that have been built by developers across private property are or should be considered 100 percent the general public's responsibility with the accompanying sh cost shift. Um, but that's not what we're talking about. No, I, I want to keep the apples to apples and the oranges to oranges here. All right. A uh, motion by Mr. Turner. I'm sorry, Taylor. Excuse me. Is there a second? I'll do a second if I can find my computer. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, further discussion on the motion? If not, those in favor, please, when when technology brings it up on your screen, vote yes. Not showing. Yeah. So I think, Mr. Bessie, this, is, this is an informational item, right? Well, actually, there's a motion. An item, but the question That's was, do we, do we come back, are you asking staff to come back with, yeah, a, thank you. with an ordinance? So it's not approval of an ordinance. But we can accept a verbal from yeah, the committee right. as to what yeah. you would like for us to do. We don't need it. Right. I mean, right. you can vote on it, certainly. I think it's unanimous in favor of preparing an ordinance along the lines you have drafted. We've got Suggested. it. Okay. Thank you. And okay. Mr. Chairman, I, I, would, I would like also as part of the report uh, a report on how other municipalities percentages are being handled dealing with stormwater runoff and pipe issues such as this. We'll dust that off and bring. And I, and I particularly would like to see, you know, dealing with the issue of how do we know what pipes are on private property that the city has installed. And I believe that, we that there needs to be a map, is there a map somewhere that says these are the public water work systems a part of our water infrastructure runoff program. Do we have that map? I'm not aware of any such map this. like that. Council do, do we know where the water runs when we when we put it in the storm drains? Yes. Yes. Good. Then somewhere we've got a map that shows us where that piping is, and but on, per, on per, the ownership of on sure. personal property where pipes are running across on personal property. Uh, we'll bring what you have. Yeah. We'll bring you what we have. What you yeah. have. We don't. We don't. We're not have a map of that system on private property because it's not ours. We have a map of our the system in the road that we own and maintain, and that's ours. And perhaps how it connects with that. But for, for clarification, before it gets too concerning, uh, we do have inventories of some private systems that are necessary for us to use. Uh, as our water flows to or from. So we did an inventory of all of our system, right. and as part of that inventory, we picked up Good. some private system. So Good. that's why I say we'll bring you what we have. Good. It so will show some private, it'll show all the public. Right. Right. But we don't We, we have an hook our storm drains. We hook up our road storm drains to pipes that carry water away. You know, we surely must know where we're carrying that water and what the pipe systems show. And that ought to show us where it's going across private property. Now, who put in those pipes? My gut is that the city put in a bunch of those pipes, and I don't know that they attached. Maybe they attached to other people's private pipe or whatever, but my bet is is that connecting to those storm drain openings in the street, that those are, those are pipes that have been installed by the city to move city water off the street to someplace else. And I want to know basically where those pipes are going across private property. Yeah, we'll bring what we have. Good. And as a matter of record, this is a systematic discussion that we have had, I think, at least twice during the last uh, 15 years, yes. and we, we can gear up and do it again. I used to um, do puppet work. Then all the information is available, and I will be totally satisfied when I see it. I, I don't think so, because I, I think what you'll find is that there is no such comprehensive uh, mapping of oh, all yes. private right. pipes. Right. And, right. and yeah. normally, well, in, in a number of cases that have in most of the cases that have come forward in my district or others that I've looked at, uh, it is not a matter in which the pipe being across private property in on sort of a house by house basis has ever been in, built or installed by any public agency. And as part of the information, we'll bring back some, I think we'll bring back some information on the general duty clauses of the law that basically allow communities and developers to tie to systems that are already in place. And I think over the decades definitely and over the last hundred plus years as the city of Winston and the city of Salem and the two cities uh, the joint city 
have developed, they have used that provision in order to create a comprehensive system. So, I mean, the council is aware, the members of the council are aware of the fact that we've been talking about some deficient systems on private property in the downtown area that are at least 100 years old. So, anyway, we'll bring back what we have. All right. Thank you very much. Um, interesting discussion. Uh, item 6, please. Item G6, information regarding stormwater concerns of Ms. Lorraine and thank you to the folks from the Casal Street neighborhood for uh, coming to uh, visit with us and, and track this very important issue. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Mr. Turner will be reporting on this. Again, this is a situation which uh, uh, has been before us on how many occasions now? Uh, three or four, I'm not. Yeah, three, three or four different occasions. Uh, and so if you would please update us on what has uh, happened uh, to date, what the what the city has been able to do and what the additional information you're bringing to us this right. time. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, as you recall from previous discussions, Ms. Pollock has a serious concern about the water flow that's coming onto her property from upstream. Uh, now, in this situation, it's all private connections that are creating the problem for her. She is downstream from the railroad tracks, which um, rural right of way which have a inlet that is collecting water that's also coming off of private property. And the property that she has has a half vacant lot, and I'll describe it that way. She has her house on the northern half and on the southern half, it's a undeveloped lot, let's phrase it that way. And in that undeveloped lot, there's a bowl system, and that bowl system is collecting the water that is flowing to the west from the railroad tracks and from the property that's to the east of that. Uh, we have looked at her concerns, which, by the way, are that there is flooding and standing water whenever there are heavy rains, and that there is debris being washed onto her property from the upstream uh, development. We've looked at her concerns. We've looked at the history of the property because she at one time uh, had expressed concern that the city had been involved in the sale of the property to her. What we found was that the city had sold the property to a developer who then in turn sold it to Ms. Uh, Pollock. Uh, she asked whether there were any legal remedies that she may have with uh, pursuing the uh, original developer. We weren't able to find anything there. Um, in terms of solving the problem of the standing water that she has expressed concerns about, uh, we've analyzed what the cost of the project would be, and I think we've reported in the past about it. It's about a half a million dollars of uh, development activity that would need to take place in the public right-of-way in this situation uh, in order to upsize all the pipes from her property west or downstream until you get to a daylight situation where the water runs into a creek that's on private property as it happens. Uh, and we also have looked at whether the current 7030 policy or any revisions there too that have been talked about thus far would provide her any solution. Uh, the restriction, there are certain prerequisites in order to qualify for the 7030 program. Uh, we don't find that she meets any of the current prerequisites that the City Council has adopted. The previous one on Cassell Street that we talked about uh, does meet the severe erosion problem mm -hmm. that is a prerequisite is one of the prerequisites for the 7030 program. Uh, but unfortunately, Ms. Pollock's situation doesn't satisfy any of those existing prerequisites. Um, there's information attached to the package showing the area, showing the uh, problem, some photographs showing the problem she's having, and there's a diagram in the package showing what the construction concept would look like. I'll be happy to answer, I'll be happy to answer any questions the committee may may have. No, thank you. <clears throat> uh, questions? <coughs> you can see from the photos and in, in the uh, materials that this is a sort of a long, um, yeah, yeah uh, a, a, a low area between the, the street and the, the railroad that um, the pipe which comes off the railroad uh, does result in you know, significant rainfall events and standing water uh, in the low area which you know makes up a substantial part of the sort of the adjoining lot uh, and 
from I understand that there's no um, storm water system in our streets in this area. And nothing that discharges on amount onto this property, is that correct? Correct. I mean, I, I'm not talking about discharging. I'm talking about are there any within the curb lines of this block? Yes. There are storm drains that are taking water off the street. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And so to tap into that from this sinkhole, this hole, this waller, um, is it possible to run a drain line from there to one of those storm drains? There is one currently running from that uh, inlet in her yard out to the public right away in the public storm drain system. That just blocked or it's not working on it. Well, the issue is it's undersized for the concern she's having about the water standing in that low area on her property. It's able to handle the water as it draws down over time, yeah. but in order for it to receive and transmit all that water without any delay would require upsizing the pipe. How big of a pipe, pipe is that? I have to go back and talk to the and designers. I'm not sure. I'm assuming she put that in. Or no, no. Put it in. Developers would have put it in when they built the road when systems through there. The when they built the road or when they built the... When they, they built the road the systems. Okay. When the pipes were put in in the right-of-way is when uh, were done when the developer built the road system. But the pipe on her property connecting to the no water system. It, it drains the, the low space. So there's, there's, so there's a drain. I'm sorry? I'm sorry. There, there, is a, there, there is a drainage system structure in place to move water from her waller low space out to the street or to the stormwater system. Correct. It's, again, one of, it's my understanding that, again, that's one of those private lines private that's line. connecting to the public system. That's her private line. I got, and, and, and I'm with you on this one, uh, that that's a private line moving water off of her site into the public right of way or right. into a storm drain system. Correct. And that line is not functioning properly? It's a common, it's more than just that line, it's the entire system between that line. If you look at the map that's, um, I think it's the first attachment. With all the, all the red lines? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's the entire system that runs from her property west to Oak Street. So we have, we have pipes in 14th Street, we have pipes, stormwater runoff pipes that are, that are carrying water off the street or off whatever. Correct. And, and she hooks into that piping system, it's not adequate to carry what she's generating? Correct. It's not adequate to handle it without standing water at times in heavy storms. Wow. Without getting some backup and a period of drainage. And then, like I said, the secondary, well, the other concern may be primary, but the other concern is that when that water is collecting on her property or uh, moving onto her property, it's transporting trash from that's upstream. A, and that's a railroad, and that's a battle that mm -hmm. impossible for her to fight. The, uh, it, is there a backflow issue from, from the city water system? into her pipe back up into the land? That if, if, the, if our pipes are that small on 14th Street, are we getting a uh, heavy storm? Are we getting reverse flow into her pipe? I haven't heard that. I'd have to check with the stormwater director to see if that issue has come up, but I haven't heard of it. If, if that, I mean, what I don't understand is why the pipe that is currently draining that site is not adequate if it's connected to our storm system. You know, it can't be that heavy of a load, or it should, it should be fairly efficient in removing the water fairly quickly, I would think. It's at the end of the line. Unless she's getting back flow or something else is going on. In general, what systems designed in this era were designed for is a 10-year storm. And what that means is a storm that has a 10% traditional probability of occurring. And what we have seen over the last several years is there is a much higher frequency yeah of much higher intensity storms. So this community has probably experienced several 25-year storms, maybe even, maybe even some 50-year storms that have certainly exceeded the capacity of the design standards for the line that was installed at the time. I don't think we can do much with this one, uh, except I would say 
it, it making sure, somebody needs to make sure that drain line is in fact open, and I'm assuming that's the property owner's responsibility mm -hmm. to, to make sure that, it, that it's clean from her drain off into the public water system that it's supposed to be draining into. And then the second thing would be that I would be concerned about is whether we're getting backflow. Uh, if you say the capacity of these pipes isn't that great and we're getting heavy water episodes that are stressing the system anyway, that water's going to find a place to go. And it may be going back in her pipe up into the up into that void, simply as a way to escape. Um, I, I, these are these are engineering problems that really I think she may want to to, to, to look into um, to to see if, if that's part of the problem as to why the water is seems seemingly so rapidly huddling there. And we will work with Ms. Pollock on assessing the condition of the pipe from her property into the catch basin or into the yard inlet, um, but we will also look at whether there are any obstructions to the system that have occurred in the last several months. We've looked at it the last time this item came to the committee, yeah. but we'd be happy to look at it again. I think it would be a, a great civil service to um, clean the line, make sure the line's clean, maybe try to make an assessment as whether we're getting backflow and uh, ultimately, if that line, enlarging that line is an issue, that's the property owner's responsibility, I think, ultimately to do that. But I do think from a purpose of, if our system is so marginal in, in that part of, of the town that we may be experiencing a complete capacity on a storm water episode, that water is going to go back in both directions on that pipe. Well, is it, is it the case here that, that Ms. Pollock's situation is complicated by the placement of the railroad strain? Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's, it's going to be receiving uh, more water from off-site than, you know, um, than, the, than the houses adjacent. Oh, yeah. it, it's that, Council Member, but it's also the fact that the railroad's housekeeping of their right-of-way isn't as, yeah. as high as it is for the yeah. public streets. Yeah. So when there's debris that's just left on their right-of-way and a storm comes along, picks it up, it then transfers it, and that's one of the reasons why there's the drain of the strainer we got system a screen. that is around their inlet pipe, and it's to try to reduce that. Okay, uh, Ms. Adams, did you have inquiries? Um, uh, and I know you missed the first part of the discussion, consulting with constituents. Uh, did you have any questions you wanted to to raise regarding the presentation? Not at this time. All right. Um, do we have any other information, Ms. Pollock, uh, that you'd like to tap and Again, with apologies for the record, uh, name and address, and then uh, let, let us hear any other information that we should have before us, please. My name is Doreen Pollock. I live at 1401 North Main Street. Mm -hmm. And the last time I came to this meeting, you uh, all had agreed to come to the property to observe it yourself. And I'm not sure that you came to the property so you can see what's going on on the property. And also, uh, this issue of the storm water, or whatever you may want to call it, was brought up when I first moved into the house. This is not something that just happened. This has been going on for 21 years. When I moved into the house in September, uh, it was um, just beginning to go winter, winter. And the question was asked through the city and the home builder why I was getting so much land. And I don't want to go through everything. And they told me because it was too small to put another house there. They did not tell me that it was a drainage on that property. Because if, a, if they had informed me that that drainage was on that property, I wouldn't have had my house built there. So this is not something that just come up. Uh, I was coming here pretty regularly, but with my husband passing, I had too much on my plate. You know, I wasn't really, you know, and then my daughter's in the military, uh, her and her family, she has kids. So I have to keep her kids while she go to war or whatever. You know, that's irrelevant to the fact. So I couldn't come as much as I want to come, but I don't feel that I should be held responsible because the city had to sell the land to Anderson. And you have all these permits when they finish this on your land and that on your land that they have inspected this and they have inspected that. And then when you come to find out, just like I was agreeing to some of the stuff this gentleman here was saying, I don't even know your name. I would like to address your name. What's your name, sir? John Larson. Mr. Larson was saying uh, homeowners 
shouldn't have to bear the responsibility of stuff that was hidden from them. And this is something that I made very clear to Mr. Turner and Mr. Garrity when I moved on the property, that this stuff was happening. And uh, it did help a little, just a little, that the railroad did put that pipe in. It um, stopped 90% of the trash from coming on the property. And as far as the water, the water uh, sits. It don't just go away when it starts raining. It sits there for a while. The yard is full of mosquitoes. So I really can't have my, kid, my grandkids, I have 11 grandkids, and I really can't have my grandkids to be out there because I'm afraid they may get bit by a uh, mosquito or something to that effect. So I feel that I would wish you would come and observe the property like you mentioned in the last meeting so you can see what's going on on that property. And a lot of the stuff, uh, as it rained, uh, I only saw one stone on the property. If you go now, you see about 15. So all the dirt and grass is washing out. You got a stone here. You can't even go straight and cut the grass. You got a big stone here. You got a big stone here. You got stones that's coming off. I, I guess it was a land. I don't know what it was before I moved there. But you got all this stuff just surfing up in the yard like you at a cemetery and all the bodies is washing up. That's the way it look. And I don't feel that you, I'm not saying you as a person want to live on a property like that. And I feel that the city should have had a responsibility to tell Anna, or Anna, or whoever, she had a responsibility to let me know what was on the property. That's all I want to say about it. But I still, I still would like for you, as um, our leaders, to come to the property. And I addressed it the last time that I don't have to be present for you to go on my property with Mr. Turner and look, survey it yourself. Then you can see what I'm going through. All right, thank you, Ms. Pollock. Uh, Mr. Taylor? Ms. Pollock, I just have one question. I, I may have asked you the last go around, but I want to make sure I'm clear. Uh, Ms. Anderson, who you mentioned, have you looked into the possibility of going after her? Well, the last time I heard with the city, Anderson was in the uh, bankruptcy because they, she was building houses in the um, Glen area um, where they're building the habitat houses on. Uh, Mm -hmm. Off the trade, trade Street line, that, that uh, she went into bankruptcy and they taken over. The city took over, and I think Habitat has built 80% of the houses there now, and they are continuing to build the houses. So I don't know where Anderson is. All I, last I heard, she went into bankruptcy. So, so you've determined that you are not able to go after her legally, even though I've heard I what you just said. Yeah, I don't feel that I should go after Anderson legally because the property had to be sold, had to be sold for her. To her, what did they hide from Anderson that she didn't know? Thank you, Ms. Paul. Madam Attorney, if I may. Please. Do, do we have the right to look into some sort of legal uh, situation with Anderson? I don't think so, because uh, normally when we sell property, we sell property as is. And the developer basically takes that property with that understanding, and the developer, you know, develops whatever. Uh, houses, the homes uh, he or she planned to develop on the property. And as a result, the relationship is really between the developer and the property owner. And I understand with the lapse of time there may be some challenges there, but in terms of what the city's obligation is, I don't think so. So do, do you know if Ms. Pollock has the ability to have some sort of legal recourse against them? I wasn't able to find anything, but I really think she needs to consult with the property owner. Thank you. Ms. Pollock, I think um, I mean, we've heard, we've heard this issue before, and, and obviously it, it is a problem for you. I think the city has limited uh, capacity to uh, delve too deeply here into this. This water problem is coming off a railroad property. It's not coming off a city property. Um, it is coming onto your property that you own. And, and my only question is, is how, you know, whether or not it's an efficient system of moving the water from your property onto a city storm drain system, which is what the city maintains. Um, the, it appears to me that maybe that system that we have in that part of town may be undersized and may be a problem uh, with the capacities of the storm water that's being generated in the general area. 
And I think that um, what I hear uh, Mr. Turner willing to do, and I think it's, it's appropriate, is to at least do an assessment of that, of that storm drain for you uh, and just make sure that that is open and functioning properly. And the only other thing I sort of asked was to make sure that, that we weren't getting water that was in the stormwater system backfilling onto your lot somehow or another uh, in a backflow system that exacerbates the water collection. I'm not sure that's the problem, but that would be, I think, some responsibility that maybe we could try to fix with a backflow valve or something. Uh, and and other, other than that, you know, the trash issues they've tried to address with the fencing, you're working with the, relate, with the railroad, uh, is it going to kind of limit then what I think w what we can do based on where the water is from and the privacy of, of your lot? It's a little different from what I was talking about earlier. Doesn't mean I'm not sympathetic, and I appreciate Mr. Turner's willingness to try to work with you on trying to help solve that problem. And I hope you know we'll see something coming out of that investigative. I'm not sure why the lines that were put in don't seem to be functioning and meeting the need. Of, of the of the basin and the water that's being collected the water quality or the water mass is too high to handle that or something's blocking the line or something's going on that maybe has changed over the years and i think that's that's worth investigating and maybe we can help you with that mike sorry this goes way back and in the beginning, when I talked to Mr. Turner concerning the uh, issue, he had agreed to uh, look at it and uh, said, I can do the 70-30 plan during that time. Uh, uh, and I told him, I'm just a homeowner trying to afford a house to stay in, and I couldn't afford it at that particular time. My house is paid for. I have uh, paid it off three years early. So I may can come up with some things to help, which I don't feel I should, but it's not like this, it was the off, the, that it wasn't offered at the beginning to do the 70-30 plan with Mr. Turner uh, a year after I moved in that house. So this is not the first time this has been an issue. I don't know whether he wrote that in his uh, details in the beginning, but talking to him over the phone, and in person, that was an offer that he offered me at the beginning. All right, uh, thank you. I, I think that we have committee consensus that uh, there's a couple of questions that have been asked, further questions have been asked for Mr. Turner to see if he can develop information and provide that, Ms. Pollock, to you. Uh, that's the only action that has been brought that we can do for our discussion, really, at this point. Um, so thank you. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Turner. I believe that concludes this item, and that concludes the agenda as planned. Uh, Mr. Turner, is there anything else to come before the committee this evening? No. All right, then I would suggest that it is appropriate for us to adjourn. Thank you to all staff and uh, members and public for coming this evening.